Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 15th Emerging Growth Conference. I'm Anna Berry, and I'll be your host. As always, we have an exciting list of companies and a wide range of growth sectors presenting to you today. Just a few notes for those attending. It's a live, continuous event beginning now and running until 2 p.m. Eastern time. So when we switch to the next company, you're going to see a black screen for a brief moment, but don't go anywhere. That's just us moving over. If you do experience downtime for more than a minute or two, just refresh your browser and everything should work properly again. And our platform does work best on a Google Chrome. So if you're watching from an Apple device, hit the play button to start the session. So our previous conferences and all conferences to come will be uploaded to the Emerging Growth Conference YouTube channel. Please subscribe at youtube.com slash emerging growth conference. During each company's presentation, you can submit questions through the webinar module and the presenters may attempt to address as many of these as possible at the end of their presentation. One last note, after today's event at 2 p.m. Eastern time, you'll be redirected to the registration page for the next conference. So be sure to stay on or come back at the end to reserve your spot early. Today, we have six companies presenting. So without further ado, I will introduce our first. We have Digital Brands Group, Inc. It trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol DBGI and offers a wide variety of apparel through numerous brands on a both direct-to-consumer and wholesale basis. Please welcome its CEO, Hill Davis, and CMO, Laura Dowling. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank Hi. you for having us. We're happy to have you back on the Emerging Growth Conference and listen to your presentation and hear some updates. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining our presentation. You know, our goal during this presentation is to communicate three key drivers for Digital Brands Group. One, our acquisition is stateside yesterday, which we announced. Two, our future acquisitions for the rest of this year. And three, how our current brands and our acquisitions come together and what that means for our investors, including revenue growth. So let's talk about the stateside acquisition. As you may have seen or heard yesterday, we announced our acquisition of stateside. While this acquisition took longer than we expected due to having rollback inventory to 2019 levels per the GAP PCAOB audit requirements, we did finish it and close it. And most importantly, we learned a lot about the audit requirements and how to make the process shorter for additional acquisitions. The stateside acquisition will add approximately $6 million in revenue and $1 million in EBITDA this year. We believe there are three major revenue drivers for stateside as we integrate them into Digital Brands Group. So again, I just want to make sure everyone understands this is a very accretive acquisition. It'll add about six in revenue and one in EBITDA. And the three revenue drivers as we go forward. First, Stateside has spent little to no money on digital marketing and e-commerce represents less than 5% of revenue. We believe this is a significant opportunity for us to layer our marketing and digital or their marketing and digital needs onto our platform and use our team to generate very easy and quick revenue upside, including the photo studio, which Laura will talk about, uh, that we launched yesterday, and also just the team she's building. Second, Stateside has limited wholesale distribution, which we are expanding right away. This is a huge opportunity to grow brand awareness, and it's very profitable revenue with almost zero additional cost, just making samples. So you've got digital, marketing and e-commerce, you've got increased wholesale distribution. And third, you have a very limited and tight product offering due to just how they manage the business and the limited wholesale distribution. With our balance sheet and expanding the product lines, we plan to increase the product offering to reflect the most requested items from wholesale accounts and customers. And I think this is really critical. We're not trying to expand into this white space. It's actually items that are being asked for by the wholesale uh, accounts as well as the online customers. I think that's really powerful. So given this, we see meaningful upside or meaningful revenue and EBITDA upside in 2021 and especially in 2022 based on the digital marketing e-commerce revenue, increased wholesale distribution and product expansion for e-commerce only collections and our wholesale partners. Finally, there's meaningful EBITDA expansion opportunity as we leverage our backend ops and finance, and most importantly, leverage our marketing platform and teams. This should result in a minimal increase in operating expenses relative to the significant lift in revenue, because this is us 
basically leveraging our shared platform. So we're able to drive a lot of incremental revenue through these drivers and add very to little, no cost associated with that revenue. In short, we acquired an underfunded strong brand with three significant revenue drivers and plenty of EBITDA expansion for years to come. So how does this relate to our future acquisitions? Well, as we discussed in our S1, we expect to continue to grow through acquisitions and expect to continue to acquire more companies this year, most of which will require GAP PCOB audits. As we better understood the audit process and timing issues associated with stateside, we realized that we needed to run multiple audits at once. That would keep the acquisitions moving forward. Let me repeat this. We realized we needed to run multiple audits at once if we wanted to close several acquisitions this year. As we stated in our quarterly calls and press releases, these audit requirements will result in that delayed acquisition time frame, which you saw, that would happen in the back three or four months of 2021. So yesterday, August 31st, we announced stateside. We are running multiple audits at once. So as you think about the timing, we're really excited about our acquisition pipeline and all the potential acquisitions we are being presented. All of them are cash flow positive and very high in revenue. And we think it's important that everyone understand that we've learned the process. And more importantly, we learned that we can run multiple tracks at once. I think the most important thing that everyone should take away from our acquisition strategy is scale is critical. And the faster we achieve scale, the more value we can create for new and existing customers, as well as for our investors. Given this, we consider stateside a small acquisition, which is why their audit was completed first and why we think running multiple audits at once was the right decision. In summary, one, we believe the stateside acquisition proves we can close acquisitions. Two, we will continue to deliver on our multiple acquisition promise for the balance of this year. And three, we need to scale as quickly as possible through acquisitions. And all these are meaningful revenue and EBITDA positive. So what does all this mean for investors? Well, in short, this means significant revenue growth for the Q3 and Q4 of this year, and especially as we move into 2022. Not only is it in increase our revenue growth, it also increases our positive cash flow for Q4 of this year and going forward. So you think about it, we get Q3, Q4 revenue lift, incremental positive cash flow into Q4 going forward, and then a significant increase in our 2022 revenue. And I think what really people don't understand and they're not doing the math on is our 2022 revenue. And it's we're looking at 35 to 40 million in 2022 revenue before any additional acquisitions. And we are running multiple audits on acquisitions as we speak. So I, I really can't stress this enough. People are underestimating the revenue impact from these acquisitions in our current business, especially coming out of COVID and having a balance sheet. 35 to 40 million in revenue with the acquisition of stateside, and that's before any additional acquisitions. And also, this is before we leverage our marketing platform and team across digital, catalogs, email, content, and social media. We will run some very compelling cross-brand promote, promotions starting in September that we believe will show how powerful this cross-marketing platform is. And Laura can talk to the fact that we're getting a two to 600% lift when we do certain programs. And I think that's really exciting. And so I think that's really key. This revenue that we're talking about is before we truly leverage this marketing platform that we're building. We already experienced significant success in this, which I said Laura will talk about. And by the way, this success was done on a very limited budget and with only two people on the marketing team, not a world-class marketing team at the DBG level with a dedicated photo studio, creative directors, great photographers and models. You know, I kind of compare it to an itty bitty toddler growing into a young adult in less than six months. I do not think most investors understand the time and process it takes to build out the proper marketing and op space to create exponential revenue growth. Having covered publicly traded retail and restaurant companies, working for a $3 billion market cap company that was launching new strategic initiatives when I joined them and launching a hyper growth apparel brand, I can promise you that it takes time to build out the proper base from people to systems to process. But once that base is built, any company can rock it off of that base to drive significant revenue, growth, and cash flow. Our base is as strong as it's ever been by multiples of where we were over the last three years or even three months. And it gets stronger every week with new hires, systems, and process. 
Starting in September, we will see the positive impact from this, which will only get better every month. As Nick Saban says, the coach of the Alabama Crimson Tide, games are won by the process. When he took over my beloved but beaten down Alabama football program, he had to install this belief in process and the systems that supported that. He finished 7-6 and six in his first season, 12-2 and two in his second season, and a national title in his third. The good news is that we do not have to wait eight months for the seasons to start. So that eliminates 24 of his 36 months to achieve a national title. We are four months into our process and will be eight months by the year end. And we expect to see significant leverage off this base that we're building. I have been through this process before, and I've been through it with less capital and less potential upside because I was limited to a single brand. We already have five brands in our portfolio and adding more before the end of the year. We have started building a massive marketing engine to drive us forward, and we have no shortage of potential acquisitions. The stateside acquisition was the first step of many steps this year, which will result in meaningful revenue and growth and positive cash flow. We have started building that base that's needed to support this growth, and we expect to achieve based on past results. We know the process and promotions work, and now we are moving faster than ever. With that, I'll turn it over to the Q&A, please. Okay, we do have lots of questions for you. Let's get right into that. Starting with Stuart O'Brien. So what acquisitions can we expect and what's the timing? So we aren't really allowed to disclose that per SEC requirements, but what we're looking at is we look at everything in terms of closet share. So closet share is basically about if someone were to walk out of the closet, they're wearing six to eight items, how many of those items can we own across our brands? So there are three legs to our stool. There's apparel and accessories is leg one. There's beauty is two. And there is home furniture is three. And we'll look across all of those to figure out what's the best thing to do and when. So we're going to stay in those three categories, apparel, accessories, beauty, and home. And we're going to try to drive closet share. And we want to make sure also that it's something that gives us either access to great Amazon data and platforms or something that really fits that closet share mentality. And I'm sorry, Stuart, not to be more uh, specific, but just per SEC regulations, we're not allowed to provide that kind of detail. But I think the key is we're running multiple audits at once. That's And stateside was our smallest acquisition, and it's done now. So just kind of you can use that as a barometer. Mario Roth wants to know, what takes so long to finalize an acquisition, and does that ever change? Yeah, it's a great question. The answer, it does change. It changes. There's three significant tests, and it's based on assets. It's based on net income. And then usually the one we trip is purchase price to market cap. So as so if it's 0 to 20%, no audits required. If it's 20 to 40% of whatever it is, so the purchase price to the market cap, it's a one-year audit. And then basically 40% uh, plus requires a two-year audit. So stateside required a one-year audit because of the purchase price. As our market cap continues to grow, these acquisitions then, because we don't, we rarely trip net income and total assets, and the purchase price to market cap will become less and less of an issue, and we won't trip that as much. And why it takes so long, it takes so long because this was the first time do this with this audit team. And secondly, the like if you take distilled, it's called finished goods inventory. So a lot of it comes over from Europe. So it lands as a finished good. So a leather jacket, a pair of denim. For stateside, it's produced mostly in LA and they have they don't do finished goods. They do piece parts. So they have fabric over here, they have trim over here, they have packaging over here, and they garment wash it and they do it to order. So the problem is that inventory, if you have to roll it back all the way to 2019 because they've never done a hand count on inventory. You can imagine they have to go and get all the invoices from all the fabric mills they ever used or the trim mills or whatever it is. So that's what took time. But through that process, we learned how to expedite it. And that's why we ended up dual tracking or more than dual tracking these uh, audits because we realized that piece. Hopefully that helps with the answer. Yeah, yeah thanks for that clarification. Uh, David Romano wants to know what the acquisition pipeline looks like. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, to give you an idea, we could acquire up to 250 million revenue right now if we wanted to. Um, it's super strong. It's across men's and women's brands. It's across home. It's across beauty. And really what we're looking at is positive EBITDA and then where we can really leverage it and make sense out of it or where we can leverage their 
uh, Amazon backend or their Amazon relationships. And I think that's the really critical part. So that's how we look at it. But the pipeline's super strong. It's just a matter of what makes sense for us now. And also the more scale we get, the bigger the acquisitions can become as well. So it's, uh, I would say, I mean, what, Laura, we've probably, even over the last two weeks, looked at seven companies. Oh, yeah, for sure. Easy. So it's, and it's a great time to be a buyer right now. And so now we're just, so the nice thing is we can be thoughtful about it. But I can't stress, we understand that scale is critical and scale has got to happen for the rest of this year. Well, some more some more questions about revenues. Doug Bowler, Bowler wants you to um, hash out some goals you have regarding revenues for 2022. Yeah, like we said, I mean, we would expect on the base case is 35 to 40 without a whole lot of incremental marketing lift. And that's just with the five brands we have. As we move into additional acquisitions, we'll obviously update that. But that's how we're looking at it. So it's basically EBITDA positive. I can't stress that enough. I mean, because you saw Warby come out and you saw Allbirds come out, both great companies doing, you know, 300 million. They'll probably trade it three times, four times revenue and EBITDA negative. We're, uh, I think, of roughly a $35 million market cap doing 35 to 40 in revenue, growing 300% a year and EBITDA positive. Seems like a little bit of a disconnect. Uh, sorry if some of these are a little redundant. We just have them coming in and there's lots of questions. So Braden Cordova wants to know, how are the Q3 trends to date and what drivers do you have to increase revenue? So more questions about revenue and the EBITDA. Yes. Yeah, so as far as Q3 trends to date, we're really happy. Now, what the big piece will be the fall when we start landing product, because as most people know, apparel is kind of back end loaded. So most of that product will land post Labor Day. But I think, Laura, you want to kind of talk about some of the results you're seeing on the marketing side with Bailey's and Distilled without giving too much granular detail, but just uh, what you're seeing in terms of the results. Um, I'm seeing really, uh, there's a lot of pent up demand right now in the market. There is, you know, this kind of transition going on right now where we're moving out of sweatwear, but not totally into the office. So when you think about it from a fabric point of view, it's more about poplin. So it's got a little bit of a stretch, but it also has some conformity to it because you're going back to work, you're seeing people in person. So for sure, I'm seeing that, you know, especially distilled, we're right in the Sweet spot with the denim. Denim is seeing a new uplift right now. And with Bailey 44, the product that we have right now is part of our core vegan leather collection. Vegan is very, very hot right now in the apparel market. And we're selling it without even trying. Yesterday, we sold 15 units of one jacket. That was $300. Like, And so we're definitely in the right spot. And I think for the deliveries that we're landing for both distilled with the outerwear right now, Yesterday, we shot um, 10 pieces, seven women's jackets, and three men's. And Bailey will be shooting in a couple weeks as well. So, I mean, we are right. We are humming. We've got the deliveries coming. We've got everything landing this month and next. So, I foresee that we're going to hit once we start we're putting more money behind advertising. Right now, we have a smaller spend. We're doing more lead gen ads to acquire. And have more emails in our database. So, you know, I see pent up demand. We're revving up and we'll have a lot of revenue coming in. We'll put even more money behind the advertising. Great. I think that's a critical thing is we're really starting to ramp digital ad spend September through the end of the year with product. And we haven't spent any real digital marketing money this year to date. Well, and here's the next question from Chris Coombs. How much marketing dollars have you put behind the brands over the last two years, and how will the new marketing budget change from that? We won't get into specifics in terms of actual budgets, but I would say over the last two years, it's been less than, uh, what, 200000 Laura, across no, all the brands? That, yeah. yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, that includes, like, photo shoots and things like that. So in pure just, con what do you call it, lead generation, it's very little, less than 100000 And we'll probably be spending that a month going forward. I mean, so two yeah, years. What the hell is saying? We haven't done any working dollars. We haven't put a lot of dollars out in the universe. What we've been doing right now as we've been basically revving up for growth is putting all the money behind content production. Um, but in terms of working, we have done what he was just saying, like less than 100000 across all of these brands. Even, you know, I haven't even had really even a team. 
And so I think, and in fact, what's interesting is when Laura first joined us in uh, 18, she came in and redid a lot of the stuff we were working on, like how we looked at ROAS and everything along those lines. And we were seeing a 2.9 times monthly increase sequential to sequential. So March to April or April to March went up 2.9 times in revenue. And then uh, the next month, 2.9 times. And I think we haven't had that uh, budget to spend and now we do. We know already through 2018 what we can do with it. So that's what we get really excited about is literally Laura's been hamstrung with no advertising dollars. Now she has it and we've seen what she was able to do with it in 2018. I mean, imagine going up 2.9 times month to month to month to month to month. That's the power of what we're gonna be able to unlock that we haven't been able to do over the last couple of years. Right on. Um, Dennis Hatfield wants to know, how is Bailey's 44 revenue since coming out of COVID? Really strong. We're back to pre-pandemic levels. The Laura just shot on Friday, I think, uh, March, and the reaction's been really strong because we're in wholesale. You're already selling into uh, basically January, February, March. So it's really exciting to see what's going on there, and we're really happy with the brand. I mean, I think it it took a little bit because of COVID, and we didn't have a designer for a while. But now that we've got it up and running. The market reaction has been super strong. And like I said, back to pre-pandemic levels. And that's going to be one of our biggest brands uh, for next year. Great. Matthew Jenkins wants to know, how are sales at DSTLD, given DSTLD is back in stock with inventory? Yeah, we've been pleasantly surprised. I think, especially on the women's side, uh, I think going back to what Laura said, there was a lot of pent up demand that we're seeing. We haven't done a lot of advertising yet because we were waiting to really spend that money in the fall and kind of have the big fall product because we got cashmere and leather and we've got denim. We just brought on a new designer who was at Redone and Hudson and Kern Elliott. She's a rock star. And we're really excited for what it is. We're really happy with what we've seen so far. And we know when we really turn it on, it's going to grow even faster. And there's some really cool promotions coming up for Labor Day where we're going to cross promote between distilled and uh, stateside, correct? Yes. So, and this is whole, one of the big mistakes retail, we think retail makes is they're always on sale. And then they train the customer to buy on sale. We're actually going to take something from the beauty industry called gift with purchase. Because if you look at the beauty industry, they don't go on sale. And, and so, but they do a gift with purchase. So when you buy a pair of distilled denim, you're going to get a stateside top. And when you buy two of the stateside tops, you get a pair of distilled denim. And now our, our cost to acquire a customer into each brand is literally less than 30 bucks. I mean, that's like better than the old school Instagram and Facebook days. And they're getting a product on the back from the brand. So we're really excited about that promotion that's coming out Labor Day. And we think that's going to be a real secret to our formula is basically acquiring customers using product from brand to brand with the GWP or gift with uh, purchase program. Great segue into this next question from Rick Eaton. Have you tested the cross marketing brand thesis? And if so, how did it perform? Laura, you want to take that? Yes, we did. Probably about a year ago, um, a couple months right after we had acquired Bailey 44, we saw like a 200% lift by just simply styling the Bailey 44 pieces with distilled. Um, <clears throat> we did it vice versa. It did even better on Bailey 44. So um, I think, and that was just a simple test. We didn't advertise it. We just... We put it in email, we had it on the website, and we saw a really, really great um, incremental lift there. And last night, we just shot Distilled with Stateside to run this promotion that Hill's talking about that'll start on Friday. It'll run on Stateside, where you can get a pair of Distilled jeans when you buy two items from the Basic Essentials assortment on Stateside. And then on our side on Stilled, you'll see that you'll be able to purchase, um, when you purchase a pair of women's jeans, straight jeans you can get a um stateside tank top so uh we're starting to test into that theory if it's anything proven to what we had prior it's it's gonna it's gonna do really well and i think you know looking at the two brands stateside and distilled they're both complementary to each other so we'll see some growth there because i think they're similar customer bases yeah i think importantly to that point i think too what laura's not really playing up as much as she should is when we did that Bailey's distilled cross promotion. It was done on the super cheap. We just brought in a, just a friendly photographer, not really put in high end models, just shot it and went on. And now we're talking about, I mean, Laura had a shoot yesterday in our new photo studio. That's like a content creation place, like who, what, where has, or any of the big brands revolve 
uh, net a and uh, you're just going to see a massive difference in the quality of the content. And so if we can get that lift off really what I'll call like C-level content only because of the budget constraints versus what you're going to see going forward, that's what gets really exciting as well is we, we haven't really been able to produce high, high level content. We started doing it for Bailey's and when we started doing it for Bailey's, we saw the revenue go. So we're excited about that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, from Brandon Holt Halderman, are you worried about any news of a market correction? Would a correction in the market change your views on the industry you're, you're involved in? I don't think so. I mean, we're, you know, I mean, we're not going to go chase oil and gas or something like that. You know, so I think at the end of the day, we're kind of an apparel, beauty, home type of brand. And so if anything, the correction in the market probably means we can acquire acquisitions even for even less of a multiple. And again, we're, we're looking at this as five, six, seven years out, not six months. Like we're not building a company so we can trade quarterly numbers, right? I think when you look at what Jeff Bezos or the Google guys or whoever came out, and they always said, we're going to build this for the long term. And if you look at all those management teams that said, we're building this for the long term, you look at their market caps from when they went public versus the ones who decided to chase the quarterly results, you're going to see a massive difference because you can't chase quarterly results. You've got to say, here's our vision, here's where we're going, and here's how we're going to build it out. And that's what I was talking about in my prepared remarks is that it's building that base. And people don't understand or appreciate the power of that base once it's up and running. At Jay Hilburn, which I started, we doubled every year once we had that base built because you have this massive platform that you can build off of. So we actually think if there was a correction in the market, that it would actually help us in terms of acquisitions. And, you know, we expect to acquire several companies a year. And again, I did uh, Wall Street, so I understand that you need to get to a 500, then a billion dollar market cap as soon as possible because you want to get out of the trading world and into the institutional investor world. Some more questions about acquisitions from Karthik Avadanam. How many acquisitions do you plan for 2021 and 2022? So obviously there, we have different deals in place. They're non-binding. So a lot of it will depend on the audits and things along those lines. But I would hope we could acquire a minimum one and up to four this year. And revenue range of 25 to 150 million to kind of give you an idea if they all went through. And that's just the ones that we've kind of are in the process of talking deeper with or have different places, different things in place. And so that's how we look at it. And then going forward, it'll depend on size and scale. You know, if we if we take down a company that's 125 million in revenue, that might take a little bit longer to integrate. And then we'll also try to be smart about it. Like we don't want to buy a ton of apparel companies and try to digest them. Maybe we buy some apparel and then we look at adding home or beauty because with that that you don't have to integrate as much and you can basically uh, digest it a lot easier so it, as opposed to if you have this huge like three or four brands coming through apparel it's harder to integrate and digest you, you can kind of start to play across the different categories which makes it a lot easier to uh, bring those on because it, until you buy the next one in that category you've got some runway without that digestion issue Nate Bentley wants to know where you see your operating margins going over for the next 12 months. Uh, it depends because I think the, they'll be positive. The question will be if we're getting massive returns out of the lead content generation, we'll continue to invest there. You know, so I think that's what I think right now trying to get to 15 percent EBITDA margins versus growing revenue four to five hundred percent a year. That's much more critical, right, to grow the revenue piece, because if the marketing is working, you want to get out there and make sure you're capturing it. So a lot of it will depend on Laura's programs and what we're doing across the brands and everything else. And so we'll we'll focus on always staying even that positive, but uh, where we can generate incremental positive revenue and cash flow, we'll lean into that versus trying to maximize margins right now. We're just too early. And I think that's what you see in most good companies is they're going to build out the base. Mackenzie Goulding wants to know what competition you have with your current model. I think everyone in apparel is a competition, everyone in beauty. Yeah, you know I mean, because you are competing for wallet share. And so I think you've got to look at that. I think where we're probably the most different, I think if you look at, so you have single brands and you have portfolio companies like VF Corp, who does an amazing job, PVH, obviously LVMH, which is super special with their brands or Keurig. But the difference is they don't, cross market like we're doing. And I think that I, I just think that's we've seen it 
live and what it does. And we're super excited about that. And I think this Labor Day program will show that as well. And I think that's the big difference is take VF Corp. They own all these brands, but they're all separate silos. Like where Laura came out of where she was a coach North America and ran their marketing, she didn't work with the Kate Spades or the Stuart Wiseman's in the portfolio here. We're working across all the brands and that's much more interesting for the customer because now it's more of a stylist piece. It's like if, um, uh, what's the box, uh, subscription service, uh, Laura? Stitch Fix. Stitch yeah, fix. So like, um, yeah, Stitch Fix, but with really great brands. And, and so that's what we're able to create is looks and styles. And that's how people want to buy. And I think the Stitch Fix market cap and Katrina did an amazing job there, um, Katrina Lake there. And so I think that's kind of the value we see is you take a traditional power of a portfolio company with all its revenue and brands, but then you take a Stitch Fix slash Nordstrom's approach to it. And that's where we think the magic lies and where the white space is. Last question from Arjun Brennan. What is your exit strategy? Is there an acquisition of digital brands in the cards for the future? Or do you plan to become a major on your own? I mean, I'd hope we become a major on our own. I mean, obviously, if someone comes in and I know Amazon's playing around in the space, I know Walmart gets in and gets out and gets in and gets out. I mean, I think everyone knows that or starting to understand that you're going to have to have a platform to really build out a lot of these brands and it's too hard as a single shingle brand. And I think that's really critical because going back to the acquisition pipeline, what we're finding is these single brands are now realizing that they have to be in all these marketing channels. They have to build out these digital teams and they don't want to do it. Whether they're PE backed, it's a $10 million investment, whether it's founder backed and they're taking a couple million off the company every year as a dividend, they don't want to make those investment cycles because they're like, they can't see that immediate return. That's our big opportunity because now they're coming to the table and saying, all right, let's play ball. Let's figure out how to do this. We get the power of the portfolio. And I think that's what you're seeing. And I think whoever builds that scale the quickest is going to be really interesting because it will be a great acquisition candidate. Whether we sell or not will obviously depend on the returns to the shareholders. But I think that's the key is that's why this is so critical is you build this new world, new age portfolio company. The value in that for someone like an Amazon, like a Walmart is really, really large because they struggle in this category. Like if you look at uh, Amazon specifically, if it's gold toe socks or if it's something like on the low end, they rip. I mean, it's amazing. But once they get into more of like a Nordstrom style brand or quality, you'll see they really struggle. They don't drive that because the customer wants a different experience. And that's where we think all of a sudden you build something like this with massive scale and you figure out these formulas that we think we figured out. It's going to be really interesting for people. And we'll just decide at that point. Great. Do you have any closing remarks? Yeah, I just I, I really having done this, having done it at a three billion dollar market cap company, having done it from zero to fifty five million in six years. I, I just don't think people underestimate once you build that base, which we've finally been able to start building once we went public in May, the power that it vaults the companies into because without the base, it doesn't work. And it's a process. And we're building that base and process. And I think that's what people don't understand. And I didn't understand when I was on Wall Street until I went to work for a company and saw it live. But then once you see it, it's pretty amazing. So that's getting built. I mean, every single day, a, a massive bricks in that base get built out. And then number two is, I don't think people are doing the math on our revenue. And I think that's what's really interesting is, you know, when you look at that, and that's just with our brands as of today, including state sites. So you can imagine with additional acquisitions, there's a there's a huge shareholder value opportunity. And that's what we're doing is building that out. And that's what we're excited about. All right. Well, this was a fantastic presentation, as always, and some great updates. And we look forward to having you guys back on in the near future. Thank you so much for your time. Yep. Thank you all. Anna. All right, everyone, we're going to take a quick break, but stay with us. We'll be back at the end of the hour around uh, 1130 Eastern. So stay with us and we'll be right back on.